I would like to introduce Marilyn Backer, who has lived beside the Pakaringa Creek of the Tamaki Estuary for over 50 years. Hello, Marilyn. Thank you, Wal. Hello, everyone. Yes, it's true. And when I first, during lockdown, walked along the riverbanks of the creek, I was horrified at the amount of rubbish and litter that I found in this instance. I gathered it together and brought it home and began to think about a project I might be able to make which would heighten the awareness of this problem. You can see the Pakaranga Creek is at low tide at the moment and there is a beautiful little waterfall that falls, you can hear it from here, it's just delightful and I wanted to make sure that that was preserved for our future generations. So the first thing that I did was to create this book which was made entirely from recycled products including the actual cover etc which um, I've utilised photographs, old and new, and also some of the materials that I picked up. I also wanted to acknowledge Ros Nicholson, who sadly is no longer with us. She was a lovely lady who was ahead of her time in encouraging the public and councils to become more aware of estuaries and the value they have uh, towards protecting our oceans. And today there is a scholarship that is awarded in her memory. You can see I've used recycled material here to indicate stormwater drain, the pipes leading down into the river and into the oceans. The book has been replicated in the form of posters, so each page has been blown up into an A1 poster. So do come along to my exhibition and have a look and see if something that you can learn and something that you can contribute. And please fill in your own personal little note of what you would like to see done or what you can do to help us improve matters. Hello Marilyn. What are we what's going on in here today then? Come and have a look. We're having a local ecology road show today. An exhibition called Reflections on the Pakaranga Creek and the Tamaki Estuary. So come on in. We begin with reflections on the Pakarana Creek and the beautiful waterway that it is and also uh, some of the challenges that face this and every other history um, that exists because with the explosion of human habitation throughout the world, throughout New Zealand, um, you're going to have ongoing challenges. We indicated before Ros Nicholson and, and the work that she did in this area and how we, she is now honoured today with a special award which is um, there for school children who are encouraged to add to her work in the environment by planting trees, by added awareness um, and by collecting water samples to aid council, that sort of thing, and that, that there are some, a lot of young people doing a wonderful job and they are awarded through Ros Nicholson's Memorial Trophy. There is quite a lot of information about the history of the difficulties in water quality, maintaining water quality of the creeks, and that's something that we need to persist with and uh, continue to work on to improve on a day-to-day -day basis. So here you can see the Tamaki Estuary in all its glory, the Pakaranga Creek in all its glory, 
in the upper reaches of Tamaki Estuary. And it's quite a significant waterway. But you can see the growth of the mangroves, which are good, they're great filters, but when you get too many of them, they start to choke the waterways. And that's something which is a result of siltation where they developed pieces of land for housing, etc. They do have to take certain procedures to stop that earth from being washed by the rain into the waterways. Otherwise, it causes excessive mangrove growth, and that becomes a problem. Just glancing up, you can see on the top photograph the reflections on the Pakaranga Creek, hence the title. And on a beautiful calm day, it's wonderful to get in the kayak and go off exploring and see what you can see. So come along with me on an ecological tour of the Dam El Pakaranga Creek. Here we go, heading towards the factories and the bin line and present. Now that's not without its problems either, because whilst you have some excellent factory owners, some are uh, not quite so excellent, and there is problems with effluent and going into the creeks. Um, there's instances of dyes and paints going into the creek, so it is important to that that's monitored and uh, steps are taken to educate our factory owners. One of the, there are lots and lots and lots of bird life on the Paparanga Creek, it's, and one of my favourites is the blue heron. So I've taken a drawing I did of the blue heron and used some of the rubbish that I picked up from the creek banks and to highlight the fact that when you throw away rubbish, it has its consequences. And um, yeah, it's important that we act responsibly and dispose of our rubbish responsibly. As you can see, the river's narrowed down quite a bit here. Um, the rubbish in the water today. But, uh, it is a very beautiful place to be. Try and capture some of the, the colour and the variation of the mangroves. I'll try not to run into them. The boat seems to be nice and stable and we're just drifting with the tide really. There's um, more factories at the end there. If I can zoom in without coming adrift. There we are. So we're heading in the direction of Howick and the back of Cascades Road, I believe. We are fairly close to the mangroves here at the moment, but just cruising along nicely and just enjoying simplicity of it all. Well, the Tamaki Estuary is said to be one of the dirtiest rivers and if you look at the slime in here, um, it's a dreadful sight and I have no idea where it's come from. There's a tennis ball over here. Somebody's dumped their chilli bin. Plastic bottles. And algae all in the water. Just, um, it's quite disheartening really, coming across a patch like that. Then around the corner, everything is relatively clean, but this of course will feed back into the main course, and uh, that's a great shame. Centering on the bow, you can just see it's gathered on the side of the boat, and uh, it's 
a little dirt, so I assume that someone's put something like uh, cleaning fluid or something like that in the water, but it certainly won't do the wildlife any good, whatever it is. There is a great deal of variety of the bird life in the Hakaranga Creek. And I had the privilege of building a relationship with a feral Muscovy duck that lived down in the creek. You can see him there, here. And they are building a nest in his in the, a flax bush that had been ripped out from the, from the bank. And uh, he would come up every two or three days to supplement his diet. And I would give him some seeds and pellets. Uh, and it, it was a real pleasure. And it was fascinating to see uh, how what, the, the way in which he behaved. And he used to climb up with his tiny little legs. You can see he's only got small legs. Climb up, climb up the bank, right up here, right up here, up to the fence, and wait patiently until he was fed and watered. Um, I, he would never tame. He wouldn't allow you to get too closely. Um, but he was very appreciative of any help that I gave him. I found fascinating the way he crossed over his wings to dry his, himself, puff himself right up, and then <laughs> like that um, in order to dry his feathers. Very entertaining to watch. And he lived uh, down on the creek, and you can see him across the other side of the creek there. And the little fellow on the right-hand side was a shame that used to come and visit him regularly. We also had a blue heron and a cormorant. So the three mates would sit on the uh, branch alongside Lucky Duck like little men on a, in the bar. And uh, it's very entertaining. The little pond was, is a gathering of stormwater uh, coming from the stormwater drain. And that is what the duck generally bathed and drank from. It would, be quite a few nasties in that, I would think. So I'm very sure that he also had some fresh water when he came up. Aren't you beautiful, Lucky Duck? So good to see you. There she is, supping on the view. And you can see that was my shadow in the way. And, um, must be like nectar to her. She says it quite regularly. You better go back and have some more breakfast. Yes, he left quite a bit behind this time. And she is thinking of you. Lovely. <laughs> I really like to see her do that. Can't move my shadow back more out of the way. Oh no, it's her own shadow. You can see her shadow reflected on the grass. The early morning. Yeah, there's her shadow. <laughs> yes. Hey, lucky ducky. You're a good girl, aren't you? You're a beautiful animal. Yes. I get so much pleasure from your visits. She's quite comfortable around me, doesn't worry too much at all. Um, I'm, I don't touch her. I think she wouldn't like that in any shape or form. She's a wild creature and I don't want to change anything that would put her life at risk or lifestyle at risk. She keeps a very wary eye about her. She also knows I'm protective of her. And I chase off the peaks and things like that. Here you go. Drying off after a bath.
Quite amazing how far she can twist her neck around when she needs to to get it. I suppose the, the lice or insects that might be bothering her. Still drying off. She's moved out into a sunnier spot to hasten up the drying. See how clever she is in interweaving her wing feathers. Quite clever. I think lucky that goes off. And then this is nicking closer and closer to the bamboo. Hasn't quite made up her mind yet. There she goes. Time I went off. Let her rest, she says. it up a bit so that we can follow her movement. Yes, yeah, she's winding up a bit now. Yes, she goes. See you later, Lucky Duck. See you later. There she goes, underneath the bamboo. There she is. And she'll disappear from sight very quickly. She drops down, it's quite a steep slope she goes down. Right, she's just checking us out one more time. There she goes down below. And we'll catch her again next time. Right, and now we're heading back towards t Out Ride Bridge and the Pike Bridge. And you can see that there are still a lot of factories along the creek at that end. So we're getting the effluent coming in at both ends. And you can see a flock of paradise ducks 
getting their food from the creek. And there we are heading to Tirak our dry bridge. And underneath the bridge, it's quite clear how the, uh, the harmful pollutants and corrosive um, chemicals can get in the water and make life difficult for the wildlife. We have to play our part and do what we can to reduce the impact of those pollutants and corrosive materials. This is the view from the Tirakau Bridge, looking at the Pakaranga football club fields there. And that I have to say is one of the worst areas for rubbish and litter, particularly drink water bottles. I've picked up sometimes six or seven just in one visit. So please, sportsmen, take your bottles with you, reuse them or recycle them, or put them in the jolly bin. You can see the growth of the mangrove forest. They quite grow very, very rigorously. And uh, you also have above what looks like toe toe, a native New Zealand plant, but in fact it's campus grass, and that is a noxious weed, so it's something we need to watch for. Because it looks like a familiar old friend, but it's not. And in the distance, a historic wharf with our early and uh, visitors to um, to the Howard Packer and the area used to bring their scales up to and it's been uh, maintained and kept for future generations to for the you know to cover the history of our area. This is the favourite part of the creek for me because this is where you have an internal waterfall at low tide. There's a drop of about a metre and a half where the, flood, the water moves very rapidly over white matter sandstone, which has been embedded with Parnell grit, which makes it very, very hard and it doesn't erode. So, this is where there was an old historic ford where our ancestors crossed, first of all Māori, to the other side of the creek. It meant a big saving in terms of time to get to where they wanted. And also for the farming settlers who were to take their horse and cart uh, carriages across the creek to the other side. In this area here, you get a very deep pool where the fish spool and you get a lot of bird life coming to feed in that area. So it's a site well worth preserving and something we've had to fight for to make sure that a bridge wasn't built over there and that um, very attractive waterfall um, decimated. And up on top, you might wonder why there is a, a chair there. Uh, it's because we were recording the sound of the creek. It's, it's and to my ears, it's quite a beautiful sound and one with um, recording. Here's the start of the water cascading over the rocks. It's quite a fall coming down. You see it here, in two splits in two. There are cascades on both sides of the rocks. And steps down. Just lovely. Really delightful. You can see the two areas where it enters the water into enters the greater pool. And reasonable depths here in this part of the river. And here in the corner is a wire sculpture done by artist Sharon Watson. Uh, it's a remembrance of Lucky Duck and uh, the beautiful white Muscovy Duck and very talented sculptress, uh, Sharon, Sharon Watson.
Oh, hi, I'm Mary. Hello, I'm Daria. Best free word, a uh, local public word. Um, we engage with local residents and we help them to carry for the environment by yes. helping them to control weeds and pests. So feel free to ask any questions. Oh, weeds. Now, I've got a really pesky weed called moth plant. Really? Right, mm -hmm. that's a real worry. What do you suggest for that? It is a very bad thing. Um, it's also um, bad for humans, just as for the native plants, because what this thing does is it suffocates the native plants, and also it has this poisonous sap. So what we recommend is to use this cut and paste method, especially if you discover a big wine at your property or around. The reason why is if you just pull it, um, it won't work, it will regrow again. So what you want to do is you want to uh, find the base of the stem, you want to cut it, and then you want to apply some picloram. Um, this is a herbicide that burns the uh, roots and prevent them from growing. So where does, where does a person get that from? If you've got a problem, you see a problem, go and say at the local banks, where do you get it from? Uh, you can get this base from us. Really? Yes. Is it expensive? Um, it's covered in your rate. Just as it is covered for the traps, you oh, can so also... Not. Yeah, so, so they're basically free of charge to rate, rate players or to everybody? Uh, to residents of public area. Yeah, right. you can oh, get right. it from us and you can get free traps for yes. backyard trapping. We provide people with red traps and possum traps. Oh, right. Again, you contact us Okay. You describe what the problem is, and we will deliver a trap for you. Wonderful. Uh, we have a variety of traps to select from. We have some professional traps. They are a little bit... Um, they, they, it takes um, a while to... Uh, to load them? Yeah, to, to know how to operate them. Yes. So for the beginners, we recommend um, the easier one. This one is T-Rex. I'll show you how it works. I like the name T-Rex. Yes, <laughs> I know. It's a killer. So this one, you turn it upside down. So if I'm the mouse, this is a mouse, is it? Um, that's a Mr. Rat. A Mr. Rat. Mr. Rat. Right. Um, so you have this trap, you turn it upside down and there is a slot inside. You take it out and you put some uh, peanut butter in it or right. mayonnaise. I can see his nose leaving already. Yeah, yeah. it is excited already. So we put it back for Mr. Red. And then we leave our trap. We need to set it on. And it's very easy with this type of the trap. We just oh. drive it until it clicks like this. Right. And now what happens? Our Mr. Rat from sniffing. Ooh, what's that? Ooh! <laughs> Boom! And it's dead. Yes. Very good. As easy as it is. Wow, that's effective. Sorry about that, Red. Yes. Such is life. And what about the possum trap? Because we've got a real problem with possums in our area. How, do you, how, how does that work? What, what, do you, what sort of bait do you put in those? Um, the cheapest and easiest option would be an apple. So you take an apple and you cut it. If it's a small apple, just cut it in two halves. Mm -hmm. If it's a big apple, you can cut it in quarters. Right. You don't have to um, put too many of it. Okay. Right. Um, Possums love apples. You can also use other fruits, they are just more expensive compared to apples. Also, I'll tell you a trick how to enhance your kitchen um, skills. Yes, yeah, skills. What you can do, take some uh, cinnamon powder and rub it into your apple. So that will enhance the uh, aroma and possums are really, really attracted to uh, cinnamon smell. You can go even further, you can um, take this cinnamon and rub it in the bark 
Right. I'm next to where the trap is. Ah. And possums will go ahead. Yes. So it sort of acts as a. Um, it's, it's like the smell of cooking. Yes. Out of the Pretty kitchen. much. Mm. Pretty much. Come into my kitchen. <laughs> yes. Great. I've learned a lot. Um, now, wheat is something that I'm always interested to learn about what it entails a wheat. Do you mind if I take one of your brochures? Yeah, feel free. Feel free, you can take this guide. Thank you. It will Thank tell you. you what kind of weeds we have in area, why they are bad and how you deal with them. We also have a separate booklet dedicated to moss plant as one of the um, nastiest weeds we have. And again, it tells you how you can identify it and what you do with the pods and with the wines. Wonderful. Yeah. That's very informative. Thank you for that. Um, and perhaps you'd like to tell us something about Pestry, the organisation, and how you came to be involved in it. Right. I, uh, me personally, I started working with Best Free Hobby Court um, in August last year. So I'm one of the conservation assistants. Right. The, uh, we are local board. We work in collaboration with Auckland Council. Yes. Um, and do you do this full time? Um, at the moment, it's my part time job because I'm also a student at the University of Auckland. But once I'm finished with my studies, um, I'll think I continue <laughs> with Best Free Word full time. Oh, excellent. It's lovely to have met you, Daria. Likewise. And well done on a, a job well done. I'm sure that people will be in touch with you um, for some help and, and looking after and getting these nasty beasts under control. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Cheers. Lovely Bye. meeting you. Nice. Sadly, there are challenges. And one of the key challenges is the ageing infrastructure that we have. You can see the Aging uh, water pipe. This is a stormwater drain. It's going flowing directly out into the uh, creek. So there you can see here on the concrete pipe, it's deteriorating. Auckland Council's doing their best to catch up, but there is a lot to do. This is an indication of stormwater drain blockage. So this is in our local street. We had a heavy rainfall for a relatively short space of time and we have a flood. So people can do their bit and make sure that the stormwater drains uh, in, in, their, in their street, the tops kept clear of litter. In fact, if they can stop throwing litter into the street, that will be a big help. This is the rubbish collected in just one hour's walk along the walkway, and quite a bit of that rubbish utilised in a sculpture that I made. And we'll show you that at the later stage. So this is the ongoing challenges for us, the factory discharge and runoff and rubbish dumping. And uh, some of our pests that make life difficult, the moth plant, which we see here. Now this amazing natural um, weed is, as you can see in the photograph here, when it, it ripens and is ready to um, expose its seeds. It just blows right out and can contain up to 1,000 parachute seeds which will float over a wide distance. And that's one of the reasons why it's such a pest because it's a, it chokes plants, chokes our native trees and is a real nuisance. And not to be confused with the choco, which is a edible vegetable and you know good to have them growing in the garden. So there's two. Just walk that in so you can see the difference. Of course opossums, weasels, rats and feral cats are a challenge and people such as Pest Free Howard are doing their utmost to encourage uh, homeowners to 
take control of those and they're also setting traps in the district and they'll come and provide free, free traps for people. So there you can see from that photograph there, uncontrolled clearance of banks with the earth pouring down into the creek um, when, the, when the periods of rain and the variable water quality. So the councils do test the water from time to time and uh, sometimes there can be some real nasties in it. So I wouldn't advocate swimming in it and certainly not putting your head in the water. If I turn this way, you can see this just um, would like us to talk about contaminants in the sediment. Um, the, the, again, the council are testing for copper, lead and zinc content and they're all found uh, to some degree in the, in the sediment. There's quite a lot of wild uh, marine life in the Pacarana Creek, but there's no real database of it, so that would be great if we could, could encourage students, for example, to record the, some of the marine life that they find and see in the creek as they do their studies. In terms of the history of the area, uh, as you saw before, the present-day Tamaki history was formed about 7,000 years ago when the valley was flooded. Uh, and then in the 1600s, uh, their, uh, the Māori name for Pinton Mountain District was called Pakuranga Arahihi, which was then shortened to Pakuranga. And it refers to the legend of the day the earth caught fire. And um, yes, so there was a substantial power in the area between 1600 and 1680 AD. In the 1900s, uh, the parish, Pakarina Parish extended from Tamaki River to Tūrangi River and back to Smales Mountain, East Tamaki. And the population was about 277 people. But uh, in the 1960s, uh, some sections were offered by Fletchers and there was quite a, a building boom and a population boom and the population grew to 2,660 by 1996. And of course, it's, it, can, it has expanded considerably since then. But um, you know, just to show you, that was quite a significant time when we went from a farming community to a suburb. And it was called the Valley in those days. Just again, uh, a, a reflection of uh, life in the suburbs and the little part that the creek played in the everyday lives. The children used to fish, swim, and really enjoy the, the big swimming pool they had in their backyard. In 1996, uh, we had a situation where a, the bridge, a, a walk bridge was going to be built across the internal waterfall that I only mentioned before and a group of locals including myself and from people from the other side of the creek had a protest, it was quite a substantial one, um, had to do presentations to the Auckland Regional Authority at that time it, um, and with the help of Ros Nicholson we were able to turn that around and to convince the council that that was not a good thing to do. And this is the Burstwood side of the Pakarana Creek and you can see here that the council's already begun and done a lot of work to improve the habitat of wildlife. One is with the planting of native trees and shrubs such as flax uh, building of walkways for cyclists and pedestrians and putting in filtration ponds which create an additional habitat for the wildlife and creatures that live on the, on the banks of the Pakarana Creek but also in the Pakarana Creek. And already there's quite a lot of activity 
with wildlife in those ponds. And lastly, this is basically a summary of all the um, challenges and some of the highlights of the Pacaranga Creek. You can see the moth plant sneaks in there. You can see the sign, no dumping. And yes, just a metre or two away, someone had just dumped all their rubbish off a building site. No excuses. People are invited to write their own ideas of what we can do to improve our estuaries and therefore our oceans and what part each of us can play collectively and individually. Papa Tua Nuku, our Earth Mother, is breathing. What lessons for our environment can we learn from our COVID-19 lockdown? What can we do differently in our own backyard? our neighbourhood, our city, our country, our world to make it a more sustainable place. Your comments and ideas are most welcome. So first came the book, then the posters, and lastly the sculpture. And this came as a result of another walk along the Pacarana Creek to the Pacarana football grounds where I found, rather to my horror, this broken chair abandoned along with all the rubbish obviously from a picnic lunch and I was shaking my head that people could feel that it was okay to leave this all behind after having a, um, a pleasant picnic um, for someone else either to pick up. But I was concerned because microplastics in the waterways are, you know, a major problem in our society. So I thought it, it was worth highlighting this aspect in terms of the sculpture. So I, it, it, it's this precarious balance always that we, we notice in the, of human habitation and our, and our beautiful natural spots. Um, we have flax, which is a, a material of great strength. It's wonderful on the river banks for holding the banks. Uh, it's a, a beautiful natural plant which has flowers which attract um, native birds such as tuis. And I wanted to show the two sides of the coin, the beauty of the flax versus the not so beautiful rubbish that's left behind and centre on the precarious balance of nature and what we as humans can do to improve. So, put your rubbish in the bin and do clear your stormwater drains in your neighbourhood. Just take that rubbish away so it doesn't go down the cesspit and into the pipes. And remember, a clean estuary is a clean ocean. You can make a difference. And just let's respect the trees, the fish, the water, the trees. I hope you've enjoyed the exhibition. Reflections on the Pacarana Creek is an Arts Out East project supported by Titui and the Howick Local Board and with special thanks to the Rice Family Partnership who allowed us to use this very appropriate venue. 
I'd like also to thank Pest Free Howard for joining in the exhibition. Thank you and goodbye.